I'm going to be spending some time on this issue of trying to look at what we can do in the management of end-stage liver disease in resource-limited settings. And just to say up front that there's no definition of resource-limited. So I'm just going to assume that the budget's tight and there's not much one can do. So I think I'm going to be focusing on more simple interventions that actually give you some mortality benefit. But we're talking about end-stage liver disease, so we're talking about cirrhosis, all right? And so it's the end stage of any chronic liver disease. And we all know that it's characterized histologically by regenerative nodules surrounded by fibrous tissue. And that to the hepatologists and the purists, cirrhosis remains a histological diagnosis down the microscope. But we seldom do that. And for most times, we make the diagnosis inferentially. Now, we have a lot of tools available to us that we can actually, in fact, do that through inference um, in a given patient to say this patient, in fact, has cirrhosis. And just by way of kicking off, just to remind you that there are really two distinct phases of cirrhosis. There's a compensated phase and a decompensated phase, as it is with many other chronic diseases, such as heart failure, uh, chronic lung disease, etc. So if you look at a diagnostic algorithm, then, I mean, obviously any patient presenting with a variceal bleed, ascites, encephalopathy is very likely to be cirrhotic, or at least have significant portal hypertension. You don't need liver biopsy to make a diagnosis there. But as I was saying, in most instances in our settings, we have to make the diagnosis inferentially, and that's through physical findings, and physical finding, for example, of um, an enlarged left hepatic lobe or cordate lobe or something you're feeling in the epigastrium, splenomegaly, um, ascites, other stigma of chronic liver disease, for example, uh, if you have lab findings of thrombocytopenia, etc. And if you do have some non-invasive screening, such as fibrous scan, clearly that's quite easy diagnosis then to make. There are, of course, serum-based um, tests as well to use to make a call on cirrhosis. Radiologically, of course, the presence, as you see on ultrasound, of a small nodular liver, a uh, big enlarged portal vein, ascites, splenomegaly, etc., this all comes together and you make that bedside assessment of cirrhosis in the absence of biopsy. So as I said to you, there's very much this natural history that one needs to see in terms of chronic liver disease going through this compensated and decompensated phase. And whatever the, in fact, the initiating cause may be is what sets you up down this particular course. i just remind you that, in fact, if you look at patients and you follow them out, um, the commonest decompensating event tends to be ascites, followed by jaundice encephalopathy and um, upper GI hemorrhage. So just getting back to this and maybe building on this notional idea of actually going from compensated to decompensated, one of the issues that drives you from compensated to decompensated along this natural history course is, of course, an ongoing injury, be it viral hepatitis, be it ongoing alcohol consumption, etc. And eventually, you will actually move towards this decompensating component of the curve. Just by way of reminder, then, in fact, if you have compensated cirrhosis, provided you deal with the cause, the prognosis is actually very good. So this is the typical child's PUA cirrhotic. Uh, the median survival is very good, but once you hit that decompensating part of the curve, uh, things are not as good. So in terms of management of compensated cirrhosis, uh, we've already spoken about diagnosis. One of the first things one needs to do is ask yourself a question is, patients need to be screened for the presence of esophageal varices. They also need to be screened for paracellular carcinoma, and I'm not going to touch on that because I think Wendy's going to touch on that in the next talk. And then most importantly, and if I'll probably leave with any message today, it's about treating the underlying problem. Okay? That is what actually saves you. You remember this slide from yesterday. If you're chronic hepatitis B, for example, this is data in patients with, in fact, decompensated chronic liver disease due to hepatitis B, treated with antiviral therapy, either lamivudine or entecavir, showing clearly that if you treat people's hepatitis B, even once they've decompensated, you can get them back onto that compensated curve. This I showed yesterday as well, and the reason that happens is because you can get this degree of recession of fibrosis, and this is, of course, the entecavir or the tenofovir therapy. Again, I showed this yesterday just to remind you that, in fact, you can get recession of esophageal varices in patients with chronic hepatitis B-related cirrhosis if you follow them out, and this is with proper antiviral therapy. What about hepatitis C? Well, this is the original data. This is all, in fact, 
original publication based on interferon ribavirin data, showing that if you treat patients with hepatitis C and you get an SVR, their all-cause mortality improves, their liver-related mortality improves, and the risks of HCC drop down substantially. So the take-home point, if you look at this more recent data again, is that if you achieve SVR, and this is just one snapshot from the, from the VA study, several thousand patients, all with cirrhosis, and you look at them achieving SVR, this is on DAA therapy, as I said, you see you improve all-cause mortality as well as HEC. So the same message comes through. So if patients present with chronic liver disease and they've got viral hepatitis B or C, treat it for goodness sake. If they're drinking alcohol, get them to stop. If they are iron overloaded, venisect them, etc., etc. Treat the cause. Don't stand back and throw your hands up in disgust. So looking along this natural history curve, I want to just spend a few minutes on an important issue. And yes, some of my ID colleagues in the audience may want to somewhat differ from me, I'm sure. But anyway, we'll leave it at that. So it's this issue of bacterial translocation and bacterial infections that is so critical in driving decompensation. And, and we need to go way back, in fact, to the end of the 60s. This is data from 69, if I recall. Um, where this concept of bacterial translocation, in fact, emerges from. So in a study um, by a German uh, uh, physician, what he did was, he's perfectly healthy, took a huge inoculum of candida albicans, and he drank it, and he reported it quite clearly. Two hours later, he felt very ill. He had a rectal temperature of 38.9. I don't know if it's a thing in Germany to do your rectal temperature yourself, but clearly it is and uh, severe headache, and he had shivers and rigors, and he cultured basically candida within three hours from blood and urine, showing quite clearly that you take a very big inoculum, you translocate from the gut into the systemic system. Well, he treated himself and he was quite, quite good afterwards, so that was all, sort of all well, it ends well. But proving this concept of bacterial translocation, and this is the nubbin of the issues around what drives decompensation in patients with cirrhosis but more importantly, what sets patients up for risk of infection. So very, in this very busy slide, just to show you that it's this combination of intestinal permeability, intestinal issues, as well as a cirrhotic liver, causing bacterial translocation, bacterial products, lipopolysaccharides, driving uh, then on the, on the top end, of course, an impaired host immunity, particularly through Kupfer cell function, which drives infection, uh, through increased translocation and reduced clearance. This sets you up on this vicious cycle. The more you drive bacterial translocation, the more you drive a whole lot of inflammatory cytokines, which then in fact worsen your splanchnic bed vasodilation and then worsen your portal hypertension. And so you set up this vicious cycle, basically, of driving worsening portal hypertension, shifting you towards decompensation. It's that unsurprising that even if you look at the pathophysiology of something like ascites, bacterial translocation, in fact, is crucial to actually the development of ascites in that that drives and worsens that portal hypertension and splanchnic bed vasodilation. It's unsurprising then, just the study looking at almost well over 1,500 patients with liver disease admitted, that one third of them were admitted for infection. That's well above the average. And SBP, unsurprisingly, was the commonest infection. Bacteria didn't differ, it was really unsurprising, typically gram negatives and some gram positives, endrococci, for example. And so, again, yes, something that actually has survival benefit. Just to remind you, if your patient has an upper GI bleed, be it variceal or non variceal, they've got chronic liver disease, the addition of empiric antibiotic cover has got survival benefit. Just look at this particular study as one of the originals showing that in patients with SBP, at least, uh, at least patients with, um, with upper GI hemorrhage, those given empiric antibiotic therapy had lower rates of bacteremia and perhaps even had mortality benefit in this particular study. This is a consequent study, in fact, showing some, some similar trends. Those with this instance variceal bleeding, given empiric antibiotic therapy, had reduced re-bleeding rates. So that's good level 1A evidence, in fact, in randomized control studies showing that the addition of antibiotic therapy in patients with chronic liver disease and bleeds improves survival and reduces rebleeding rates.
So bacterial infections in cirrhosis, the incidence of infection is very high, much higher than general population. Multi-resistant organisms are a big problem, okay? And that should always be taken into, into cognizance when using antibiotic therapy, obviously. Infections are a big promoter of acute or chronic uh, liver decompensation. And most importantly, uh, diagnostic and treatment delays enhance mortality. So your patient comes in, they're having a bleed, start the antimicrobial therapy. If you think they've got SBP, start the antimicrobial therapy. So if we just look at the natural history again of portal hypertension, ultimately we have this flank negative vasodilation, worsening portal hypertension, and one of the potential consequences, of course, the development of varices. So let's just look at varices for a few minutes. Remind ourselves that varices have a natural history as well. They, if they develop, uh, then they should be small, and about a 78% rate per year of transitioning to larger varices that are at high risk of bleeding. And you can see large varices, unsurprisingly, are more likely to rupture. And once you have a variceal bleed, your six-week mortality is anywhere up to 15 to 20%. You know, your re-bleeding rate is about 60%. This is an interesting phenomenon. I don't think we have data from our neck of the woods. But if you look over the last 40, 50 years or so, the mortality from variceal bleeds, your first variceal bleed worldwide, in fact, has been declining. And that probably goes to the fact that management has got much better. And there are these interventions that have good survival benefit, and maybe we just touch on some that, that are, are easily available and make sense in our setting. So one of the first issues you need to ask yourself is around, around varices and varices bleed is issues around with varices and bleeding, do you go with endoscopic band ligation, do you go with beta blockade in terms of prevention of the first variceal bleed? If you look at the sort of meta-analysis, it suggests that endoscopic band ligation is better. But when you look at survival benefit, there's probably no difference between endoscopic band ligation and beta blockade in terms of prevention of first variceal bleed. And that's important. Okay? I'm not going to spend time on this. This is your typical flow chart in terms of management of varices and endoscopically and where and what you use um, beta blockade, and that's for your own interest. But I want to maybe step back for a second, and in our setting where resources may be limited, I'm going to assume that you perhaps do have access to endoscopy, but the fact is you can't send everybody for endoscopic uh, variceal surveillance. So are there things you can do to risk stratify patients in terms of who you actually refer, of your cirrhotic population, who you in fact you refer for um, endoscopic surveillance? So what can you do? Well, the one thing that's come through quite nicely is the use of transgelastrography. And you're going to say to me, Mark, but I don't have a fibro scan. You know, it's, you, you, you're talking rubbish. Well, the point is, fibro scan is a great point of care diagnostic test. It should be available. It should be more available in sub-Saharan Africa, and we should be expanding its use. The issues are cost. And those cost drivers, those cost issues have already come down, and they're clearly going to come down more. And it might be an initial big capital outlay, but the benefit of it is enormous, and the amount of people it can reach is enormous. So maybe the cost efficacy of transient astrography is actually not bad. But I do agree, costs do need to come down. So how do we use transient astrography? Well, this is data basically showing that if you look on the on the x-axis here, the actual hepatic venous portal um, sort of gradient, that's actual pressure, and you look at the liver stiffness, there seems to be a point somewhere around about 20 kPa when you move from that 10 to 12 millimeters mercury zone of HVPG pressures. And above that, that's when your risks of varices, ascites, and everything in fact starts. Below that, your risks are quite low. So somewhere around 20 kPa is that point where the so-called danger zone starts. So in fact, um, if you look at the, let me just get through this, sorry. If you look at, at some of the, the meta-analysis in this area, it really has looked at these particular issues quite, quite carefully and actually shown the sort of cutoffs for the actual KPA readings on FibroScan as to where you have significant portal hypertension. It's as unsurprising that in Baveno 6, which has now made its way into the <clears throat> 2016 guidance of ASLD, that they now recommend that, I'm just looking at the bottom here, 
patients with liver stiffness of less than 20 kPa on trial elastography, and they build in extra a platelet count greater than 150,000, has a very low, it's less than 5% risk of having significant varices and potentially can avoid screening. So if you've got a dual cirrhotic patient, platelet counts 170, and their KPA scores 16, you can perhaps exclude them from the need for variceal screening. But is that the only thing we can do? Well, you've got your fibrous scan machine. What about looking at the spleen? It's this long forgotten organ in cirrhosis. Of course, it's very affected because portal hypertension drives um, splenic congestion, drives fibrosis. So can it be used in terms of its prognostication? Well, clearly the answer is actually yes, because the spleen becomes stiff in time as well. So you can fibro scan the spleen, all right? And that's now been shown quite clearly. There is a new probe coming out. It's a 10 megahertz probe, which is going to be used specifically for the, for, the, for the spleen, so that may be an issue. But in fact, you can look at the spleen. And just look at this data. If you compare spleen stiffness readings to liver stiffness, you see they correlate, in fact, quite nicely. They correlate quite nicely that, again, there's the zone under which you're actually safe to not screen. And above that, you probably do need to be screening for varices. Similarly, you can see it in this particular data as well, comparing liver and spleen stiffness. So there, you can look at the right and left side of the upper abdomen, and actually you can get a rule-in and rule-out potential situation for who needs uh, um, um, esophageal uh, surveillance. Now, let's just get on to beta blockade, because I think this is really important. Okay. So, there's no doubt that non selective beta blockers uh, or band ligation can be used as first-line therapy in, in prevention of first, he of first hemorrhage. I've, I've kind of shown you that. But just a couple of practical tips around beta blockers. So you really want to put patients on proper doses and you want to monitor. Your, your, your aim is to get a resting pulse rate of about 55 to 60. Long-acting propranolol, for example, is probably better in terms of adherence and daily dosing, but if you, if you don't have it, bi-daily dosing is probably preferred. But the take-home point here is you start low and you go slowly upwards. You titrate upwards. You don't come in with 160 milligrams a day, all right? That is not good. And that is based on actually pretty good data. So look at this in, 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 in patients with, in fact, decompensated cirrhosis, mildly decompensated in patients with severely decompensated cirrhosis, showing clearly that if you give them very high doses of propanolol, their outcomes, in fact, are worse than patients who have the start low and, and go slow and rise up um, approach. So that's a very practical take-home message in terms of the use of propanolol. By the way, propanolol and aspirin, two cheapest drugs in the world. Right? If you look at drugs generically in the world, two cheapest drugs in the world. But beta blockers actually have other benefits as well. So this is data showing quite clearly that patients on beta blockade, for example, have in fact reduced bacterial translocation. And these are the sort of, un, sort of hidden benefits of beta blockade. And, and really going back to what I told you about bacterial translocation, driving, driving decompensation, this is clearly important. What about beta blockades prevention of ascites? This is actually just sideline data that came from a follow-up study looking at patients with primary prophylaxis, and they noticed that those who responded well to beta blockade had reduced development of ascites as opposed to those who did not. Just to remind you that with secondary prophylaxis, there's no doubt once people have bled, you need to go with band ligation and beta blockade jointly. There's no questions asked about that. So is propanolol really what aspirin is to cardiologists? Is propanolol the, the aspirin of, of hepatologists. Well, it's cheap, it's universally available. It's got other benefits, I've told you. And of course, it also helps for other issues such as portal gastropathy. So clearly it's good, but it has picked up a bit of bad news in the last few years. So can it patch do harm? I'm gonna run through that quickly. So this, this whole issue started out with this particular study a few years ago, about 10 years ago, showing patients with quite severe cirrhosis refractory ascites who were on beta blockade, looking at the multivariate analysis, what, what suggested worsening outcome, and treatment of beta blockades was one of those. So people said, oh, beta blockade is not good for people with decompensated cirrhosis, maybe it's not a great idea. And then there was this data showing that patients who have SBP on beta blockade, their survival's not that that good compared to those who don't have SBP, and survival is affected by those on beta blockade. There was questions maybe picking up a bit more bad news, maybe this is not a great idea. And then this whole concept of the window hypothesis emerged. And maybe people were saying that as, as cirrhosis worsens and you decompensate and you worsen your cardiac reserve, you sort of lose the sweet spot 
of where beta blockade actually starts affecting cardiac reserve, and that's why you then drive um, your, 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 your disease in terms of decompensation further. But in fact, that question was answered in a well-constructed study looking at acute and chronic liver failure. This is the now well-known canonic study from a few years ago, showing quite clearly in this patient's patients presenting with acute and chronic liver failure that those with, with on non-selective beta blockers clearly had survival benefit, and these were patients with decompensation. And looking at this meta-analysis, in fact, showed quite clearly that beta blockade is beneficial even in, in advanced cirrhosis. So it sort of led to this particular uh, editorial in, in hepatology two years ago saying the window hypothesis, the window in fact has reopened for beta blockade. So hopefully that has been put to bed for now. What about ascites? Just to mention, you all know what the typical pathogenesis of ascites is. We, we know that there's a theory around the underfill overflow vasodilatory theories, all based on the fact that central to this hypothesis there's cirrhosis, there's splanking bed vasodilation, activation of neuroendocrine responses, ultimately leading in salt and water retention, which is what your CITES develops from. So to manage a CITES, you need sodium restriction, diuretics, or large volume paracentesis. Again, simple intervention. We need to talk about patients about sodium intake. This is really quite important because you can actually calculate sodium balance. If you're taking a, pr a proper low sodium intake, you should not be producing more than 2.6 liters of ascites per week. And you can actually calculate this, by, you can in fact calculate this by measuring your patient's sodium in their, in their urine and see what they're doing. And if it's up, they clearly are not taking the required amount of reduced sodium diet. What about diuretics? Well, we know that combination therapy diuretics ab initio is better than sequential therapy. So in other words, you come in with your loop diuretic and your spironolactone ab initio rather than going from one to the next. There's better time to treatment, better time to response, better adverse events. And so you want to start your therapy of combinations of spiro and fruzumide, titrate upwards to a maximum of 400 milligrams a day. As I always say, good luck if you can reach that and up to 100 milligrams a day of, of, of frizimide, for example. Again, it's the start low, go slow phenomenon, monitoring for adverse events. And when patients' CITES respond, please taper the dose. What about large volume paracentesis? Well, that's really all that's left if patients are not responding adequately. You need to tap them off. This is old data showing, in fact, that the, 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 the complication rate from large volume paracentesis as opposed to diuretics, in fact, is much better. However, there is this phenomenon that in large volume paracentesis that you do get what's called post-paracentesis um, cardiac dysfunction and the resulting, at least cardiovascular dysfunction, and this is all result from um, an activation of plasmarinin activity after taking off several liters of ascites and at least that's called post-paracentesis circulatory dysfunction, excuse me, and um, it's, it's defined by an increase in plasmarinin activity, the incidence is about 27%. And the problem is, this comes beyond 24 hours after the paracentesis, you get an acute kidney injury and it's, and it's affected by, it affects survival. That is why we give albumin. Now, this is a problem, of course. Albumin is not widely available. But just looking at this data, in fact, looking at the amount of CITES you take off, uh, there's this zone of about five liters where you should be safe, and if you're going to replace, always replacing with albumin is better. But overall, colloid is not advised, and the next best thing, although it's not great, the next best thing, in fact, would be crystalloid. So if, you're going to if you do have albumin, how much do you replace? Then this data suggests at least eight grams per liter that you take off. So what am I really saying? I'm saying that if you're going to tap the CITES and you don't have albumin, you can probably get to about five liters of ascites relatively safely without having to replace. If you're going to replace and you don't have albumin, then, then second best would be crystalloid. Maybe something like Ringer's lactate. Just a quick word on refractory ascites. This is where it's either diuretic resistant or diuretic intractable. And this is really not relevant to this in environment because it's largely unavailable. You're then faced with the benefit of uh, at least the choice of either going on with large volume paracentesis, which is what we're going to have to do, or the possibility of a tip shunt, which is really not widely available. TIPS, in fact, does have survival benefit, unfortunately. Um, just to finish off on the albumin issue, this is the one problem where albumin does have benefit, and that is in patients with SBP getting to sort of winding back to infection again. Uh, if somebody comes with the SBP, it's quite clear, again, level 1A evidence that 
albumin plus antibiotics for SBP has outcome survival and mortality benefits versus antibiotics alone. So if a patient has SBP, the sooner you start supplemental albumin, the better. Just to finish off with a few points. What about PPIs? You know, PPIs are dished out like, like M&Ms or Smarties, we call them in South Africa. Everybody's on a PPI. But in patients with SBP, there is data to suggest that patients on PPIs have, higher, have higher SBP event rates. And so if your patient really doesn't need the PPI, you, you should perhaps consider stopping it. What about statins? So this is simple interventions. This is in patients with hep C cirrhosis. This is data to show that statin had survival benefit. Also statins and GI bleeding, some data to suggest that, that putting patients randomized in the study that were randomized to simvastatin, in fact had lower re-bleeding rates and had survival benefit. This is an important issue, and this is the sarcopenia that develops with cirrhosis. This is data looking at liver transplantation showing those with sarcopenia had really high rates of being delisted. Looking at this, showing quite clearly that 90-day mortality amongst hospitalized cirrhotics with sarcopenia is much more severe than, much significantly worse than patients without sarcopenia. So unsurprisingly, if in fact you improve nutrition in patients, by this instance in this study giving patients nutritional supplements, their mortality improves. So we mustn't forget about nutrition in patients with, with cirrhosis. It's really a critical component. Finally, I just want to end off with hepatic encephalopathy, which is really a challenge. It's really, really a challenge. We all know the actual pathogenesis of hepatic encephalopathy. We know the precipitance of hepatic encephalopathy, typically. What about treating it? Well, to treat it, you've got to identify the cause. So if it's infection, treat it, it's hemorrhage, deal with it, etc., etc. If it's drugs, sedatives, take it away. Constipation is often unthought of, but it's a well-recognized cause. Treatment up front is lactulose, all right? And then very, very short-term protein restriction while they are frankly encephalopathic, but don't protein restrict long-term. Secondary prophylaxis with lactulose, clearly beneficial as well. That data is proven. And in this meta-analysis, lactulose comes out clearly beneficial in the management of encephalopathy. So lactulose is a critical component of management, but it's not often good enough. And this data was with, really with add-on rifaximin, which is, of course, the non-absorbable antibiotic, showing quite clearly that, in fact, uh, in terms of patients' um, recurrent encephalopathy, those randomized to rifaximin did far better than those given placebo in this particular trial, as well as reduced uh, um, hospitalization rate. And you say to me, oh, but I'm, I may not have rifaximin. The problem with rifaximin, of course, is that once this data came out, certainly in, 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 in the US and Europe, for example, a drug that had been around for a long time used in traveler's diarrhea, suddenly the costs rocketed because of this particular data and the, the way the drug, in fact, was formulated at 550 milligrams per tablet. So the costs are quite prohibitive. Can I just get a general sense? Rifaximin available across various countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and yes, no, some countries, nothing. Well, it's quite sad, really, because rifaximin is very easily available generically, okay? And there's generics available, for example, in Egypt at very, 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 very cheap, um, cheap cost. So it's quite unfortunate that a drug that originally started out life as being incredibly cheap became incredibly expensive and, in fact, is available cheaply in other parts of the world. So. This is something we should be looking at and perhaps raises the issues around the uses of generics and available generic drugs in countries that are resource constrained. So in summary, then, I just want to say that I try to just cover a whole lot of concepts and issues in resource constrained areas. I think we should be fo focusing on what gives us survival benefit and, and, and those issues include treating the underlying cause of the cirrhosis. That's the biggest take home message. Stop the alcohol, treat the B, treat the C, for example. I've covered the issues around albumin, and I appreciate that albumin may not be widely available, but unfortunately, it does have survival benefit. Beta blockade is critical. That's cheap. That's available. We should be using it far more liberally. Antibody prophylaxis, that is available. There's survival benefit for that, so that's use of antibiotics post-GI bleed. Don't stop statins if patients on statins. If you think statins indicated, perhaps be using it. And then I've tried to make the point about nutrition being really quite 
critical in the management of his patients. Thank you very much.